Now, I just want, I want to give you uh, sort of what I think is the, sort of the quintessential example uh, of the interrelatedness of our economies, and that is the example of the Apple iPod. You may have heard this. It's, it's been talked about quite a lot, but I just think it bears repeating. If you look at the back of an iPod, it says, uh, designed by Apple in California, and then semicolon, assembled in China. And what that means is that uh, imports of iPods from China support high paying jobs in the United States. There's something that has been dubbed the smiley curve uh, by James Fallows of the Atlantic. And the smiley curve, if you can imagine uh, stages of production along the horizontal axis and value of production along the vertical axis, and there's a smiley curve. And the early stages of production uh, are design and engineering. Those are done by technicians, by engineers in US labs. Uh, and then you come up with the actual you know, more specific functionality and how it's going to look and feel, how the product's going to feel. Those are high paying jobs in the US. There's some component manufacturing that happens there. Uh, but then when you come down here, there's <coughs> lower, lower tech component manufacturing and assembly operations. This stuff happens in China. And then coming back, you have advertising, you have logistics, you have retailing, you have services, uh, servicing contracts. So uh, some guys at the University of California did a study on this to sort of decompose the iPod and find out who, who, who gets the value out of it. iPods, at least at the time that this study was done, sold for about $300, and the cost of producing them was about $150. Uh, most, of the, most of the value accrued to Apple. Uh, some of the value accrued to Japanese or Singaporeese uh, component producers. Very little of it. Uh, accrued to, to Chinese uh, producers. Yet, because we maintain our uh, trade statistics on sort of a final value uh, basis, uh, there's a lot of hand wringing in Washington about our trade deficit with China. We have a high tech trade deficit with China. Well, I don't think iPods are necessarily high tech, but it, it goes into the high tech stats. Uh, but should we lament imports of iPods when they're supporting higher paying US jobs? The U.S. manufacturing sector has been, we, we, we hear that it's in decline, that we've been deindustrializing. But in fact, U.S. manufacturing is quite robust. I mean, yes, we're in a global recession and manufacturing is hurting like everybody else. But U.S. manufacturing still accounts for 25% of, of world value added in manufacturing. Chinese firms account for about 10%. Uh, that's a fact that people in America and in the United States uh, certainly don't understand. We are doing less labor-intensive work, more value-added work at the upper end. We're producing chemicals and high-tech components and pharmaceuticals and airplane parts, not the things you see on retail store shelves. You know, you hear from Americans, every time I go to the store, I don't, it says made in China. I want to buy something made in America. Well, you don't see those things in retail stores. You know, these are the products that are bought by other, other producers. Uh, and we need to come to the recognition that Unfortunately for politicians, the only number that matters is, is employment. And employment in manufacturing peaked in 1979. Uh, but record profits, record value added, et cetera. And one of the reasons uh, is because, because of uh, our capacity to, to access producers in other country. Um, let's see. So one of the implications here is that Chinese and American labor like European and Chinese labor, are, are, are complementary. Uh, without this division of labor, some of these ideas hatched in American labs would never come to fruition. Uh, it would be too expensive to make these products that become ubiquitous, like iPods. Uh, and as a result, employment in the United States, where it should be at the, at the higher end, uh, is, is stunted, as is employment in manufacturing in China. So we, this needs to be reflected in policy. Um, now, I said earlier that policymakers have begun to understand this. Uh, and I'd point to, just looking at the last few decades, we've seen a lot of unilateral trade liberalization, which is the best kind of liberalization. Uh, we, you know, Australia, New Zealand, China, India, Mexico, Chile, and many, many other countries lib liberalized their trade regimes because they realized it was in their interest to do so. Um, and in fact, between 1983 and 2003, uh, developing countries' uh, trade barriers, uh, tariffs reduced from an average of 29.9% to 9.3%. And, and the World Bank tells us that about two-thirds of that liberalization was unilateral. So we have 
trade ministers in Brussels and Washington, Geneva and elsewhere, who think that it's up to them to save the world by negotiating reductions in trade barriers when governments already know uh, that it's in their best interest to do it unilaterally. We just need to make this case for them. Um, there are other examples that I would cite about why I think the, the policymakers get it. Uh, governments have implemented these trade facilitation reforms and made it easier for products to move in and out. That was the subject of the paper that, 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 that I wrote that Julian referenced earlier. Um, further evidence that policymakers understand our global interdependence is the fact, and some of you may laugh about this, but it's the fact that governments have pledged on several occasions to avoid protectionism and responding to the current uh, economic contraction. Yes, perhaps there's been some cheating, um, but I find it interesting and, and promising, quite frankly, that governments, that, that, that you know, President Obama, Prime Minister Brown, and others can get up and say protectionism is bad. They have no qualms about taking ownership stakes in banks or insurance companies or automobile producers, uh, but when it comes to trade barriers, you know, we're not gonna go there. So uh, I think that they recognize that uh, the world is interconnected and they're looking for ways to make their arguments. And that's, that's what we're going to help, help them do, hopefully. Um, beyond the pledges to avoid trade provocations are actions taken to reduce ex existing trade barriers. The, 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 uh, the media tells you about India raising trade barriers or Indonesia or Ecuador, and you hear about this all the time. But you don't hear, you're less likely to hear about Mexico's continuing unilateral liberalization. In the face of this crisis, they have liberalized significantly uh, their tariff schedule. Uh, to the tune of 70% uh, of the items on their tariff schedule, uh, con which consists of 8,000 items comprising 20 different industries. Uh, their, t their, their average tariff will fall from 10.4% to 4.3% in 2013. They're doing this while other countries are turning inward to respond to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the downturn. Brazil is doing the same thing. One of the reasons is that Brazil has a fairly integrated auto industry with Mexico and others. Uh, so they, they, they know they rely on each other. And, uh, we need the press to focus more on these examples rather than on the protectionist examples. Uh, the dismantling of global barriers, I think both political and economic, is, is a hallmark of the progress achieved in the, in the second half of the 20th century. The economic growth that it unleashed is, is indisputable. Yet at times, and, and especially in the face of perceived crises like we have now, uh, governments still undertake and consider policies that would effectively uh, reintroduce those artificial wealth squelching uh, divisions. Um, so trade policy is still lagging. The, uh, I'll speak for like five more minutes and then we'll do Q&A or maybe, maybe, maybe six more minutes.